Hello, and welcome to this week's message from Dr. David Mabry, lead pastor of Orange Friends Church in Lewis Center, Ohio. We're glad you're with us today. If you'd like more information about Orange Friends Church, visit our website at orangefriendschurch.org. Everything changes in Jesus, but not quite everything. At the top of your notes, there are some uh, scriptures out of, we're still in 1 Corinthians and we're traveling this journey. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I love how the message has these two. These are kind of going to be our launch verses to help us know like where we're headed from here. They're in the notes and then of course we can see them up here. But um, verse 17, the first part of the verse, and then 24, it says, um, P- Paul is encouraging the, these Christians at Corinth, because remember, he's having strong words with them because they're not behaving in a way that he planted this church, and like a year and a half later, he's hearing these rumors about their behavior, and so he's sending them this letter saying, okay, come on, let's, 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 we're on this highway together, let's, let's keep on the right path. And then further instructions in this, he, he says, and don't be wishing you were someplace else or with someone else. This is right after he's talking about marriage. Where you are is right now is, is God's place for you. Live and obey and love and believe right there. God defines your life. And then he goes on, just, and we're going to see the context of these verses, but these are great launch verses. These are the, these are the cornerstone for this whole concept of buyer's remorse as, as Christ followers. Friends, stay where you were called to be. God is there. Hold the high ground with him at your side. Hold the high ground. There are so many times that, um, and in small ways and some with big ways, where someone chooses to do an on-ramp for faith in Christ, is they get on this highway, and we talked last week about when someone's texting and driving or speeding or driving crazy on the highway of the family of Christ. And what was our responsibility? And that is to help say, hey, slow down or hey, stop texting or hey, you're driving crazy. Not that everyone conforms perfectly to who we are, but there's certain behaviors that are expected. That's what Paul was saying. There's certain behaviors and ways of being a Christ follower that are acceptable in the family of God. That list is not as long and exhaustive and detailed as what some people make it out to be. And that's what Paul's point is. He had an easy one. He had an easy one because there was a, there was a gentleman that was driving that highway of the faith walk that was sleeping with his stepmom. That was an easy one to kind of say, no, nah, that's not good. But then, we, so we have a smaller list, but we are clear. This is what it's like to be part of the family. But some who have done an on-ramp in the faith, they, they, they have this buyer's remorse, and Paul is dealing with it. So right after that was chapter 5, and then chapter 6, he deals with kind of human sexuality, and this is like, these are kind of expectations of how you should live. And then at 7, he naturally goes into, for us, chapter 7, he goes naturally into this, and here's what I have to say to you who are married or single, and this is, this is kind of like, and he's, he, it launches, the way he gets into this topic is, some of you are having buyer's remorse because you're married, and you became a Christian, and um, your husband or your wife, they're not a believer, and life is tough because of that. And then he launches into this and says, I know some of you may be having buyer's remorse. Some of you want to keep hundy. Some of you have this draw to get anything in the win- your window shopping. You want to buy everything out there. And he's saying, no, here's the deal. Stay in the condition you are. But he started, though, the whole conversation with everything changes. So, Everything changes part. Let's deal with that um, a a little more, a a little faster pace than what we do the second part, which is what remains the same, the not quite part. So in in your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7 is where we are at. 
What should change and what should remain the same? What should change and what should remain the same is the question we want to answer. The phrase we have is, come as you are, just don't stay that way. This first part, this is, this is the first part we catch is that, so this is a, you, some things need to change no matter what. Come as you are, but don't stay on it. But there are certain things that need to change. And that's this first part. What should change? And he covers that in chapter 5 when he confronts this church and says, wait, you have this guy who is, is a brother in Christ, so he calls himself a Christian, but he's doing this awful behavior. And then he doesn't leave that alone because he gives a whole list of behaviors that are there. So he encourages what should change, and this is the number one thing, and that is what should change is there should be a 180 from sin in your life. When you come to know, come to know Jesus, when you surrender to Jesus, the sin, your sin has been forgive, uh, forgiven, Right? And what we understand is it's forever past, forever present, forever future. You are forgiven. But Paul returns particularly, and the Bible says over and over again, but this should never give you a license just to kind of go crazy. Well, I'm forgiven. I can do whatever I want now. He had, that argument it was, was dealt with in the New Testament over and over again. No. He says you, you were sanctified or made holy, and so walk differently now. And Jesus over and over again would say, repent Um, turn from 180 away from the sin that you're involved with Paul specifically deals with this in verses 9 through 13 in chapter 5 and he says he says this I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people so this is right on the back side of saying you have this guy in your midst he says he's a, a brother in Christ but he keeps behaving like this it's like no no this is not good And so he says, I told you not to even associate with someone's uh, immoral people. But then he clarifies, not at all meaning sexually immoral people of this world or the greedy and the swindlers and idolaters, since then you would need to go out and avoid the entire world. But now I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother or sister in Christ if, if he or she is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater uh, reveler, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what I, ha- what I have to do with anyone outside and judging them, it is, is it not those inside the church whom we are to judge? And that is to hold accountable. When you see judge, it's like, I'm not supposed to judge. It's like, no, that, that word can be interchangeable with hold accountable or disciple to a deeper relationship. That's how we should see it. Not as in I'm sitting here as your pastor, and I'm going to name some sins publicly, and I'm judging from on high. I've seen how you behave. No, it's more of, I'm going to hold you accountable and enter a discipling relationship so we can help one another travel this journey together in a, in a healthier way that honors God. And so God judges those that are outside, and it ends with, purge the evil person from among you. Now, we're going to use this more for a launch of saying that a standard's been set, because we aren't going to unpack this and go, so therefore, at Orange Friends Church, we're going to begin instituting a couple of different practices so we can purge the evil one from our midst. And I'm going to start naming names today. No, we're going to talk to this more in the sense that our lives, how we live, it makes a difference. When you become a Christ follower, you forsake a life from our past. The old is gone, that new has come. Put off the old man, the old woman that was on before. It's like taking off the old ugly garment and you put on a new garment. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. It's a 180. It's a 180. So sometimes people have buyer's remorse with surrendering to Jesus or and, and the, the, the terminology that we've grown used to in, in church circles is accepting Jesus. Well, I've accepted Jesus, but then they just saw that as a, as a, um, a transaction, a one-time transaction done at an altar or a one-time prayer. I knelt once and then I'm done, but not seen as I've now entered into a whole new world. And that's why I, that's why I've been adamant that for 10 years of being pastor here, um, it's not like just a, 
uh, transaction done a one-time thing, but you're entering a whole new world. You are that new person altogether. And that means that certain behaviors are, are, are we, we cease to do any longer. And we know these. We know these behaviors. I, I, I rarely go up, interact with someone and discipling with someone and someone who claims to be a Christian, I rarely interact with someone who has something that's obviously they're really, they're, they're behaving a certain way and they, they're like, oh, wait, that's a sin? I, I never knew. Um, maybe when they're first come to know Christ, but the Holy Spirit first helps us know, discern what is right and wrong. Second thing is, is that God speaks through his word. And so when it's clear about certain behavior, certain sins, we're, we're in this new life. We don't hold on to that old any longer. We discover what that, that means. What that means. I, instead of defining them all today, I, I'm just going to give a little guidance what it means to be 180 away from sin. It, what it means to kind of, you're walking this direction, I say, okay, I've surrendered to Jesus. I've surrendered to Jesus. I've surrendered to Jesus. And it's like, but I have to turn I've surrendered to Jesus because Jesus is this direction and my sin is that direction. I, my first, first piece that I'm going to tell you is that my friends, do not underestimate your sin. Do not underestimate sin in your life and the impact that it can make. And this isn't a pastor going, I just really want everyone to be pure and then we'd be a best church we could be. And it's a, No, it's more of like, it's like a shackle. It's, it's like a chain around your neck. It's like a ball and chain around your ankle holding you back. And, and you, I think we know that. The Holy Spirit reveals that to us is that, man, if I just keep giving into the same sin over and in and it's holding me back, do not underestimate the effect of sin within your life. Do not underestimate it. The second thing I'm going to encourage you with the process of saying that's, that's 180, which Paul's calling to helping this man do a 180 away from having relations with his stepmom, is do not find comfort in your sin. Don't find comfort in it. We treat sin so many times like a, like a binky like our blankie, like our, whatever you had when you were a baby or a child and you carried around way too long in your life because it came really tattered, you had it so long. Maybe you have it when you were just a little baby. Our kids had this, and it, you, you may have this, like, um, one of our kids had a very special blanket that, um, and not a child that's sitting here right now, but it's, and it had a silky part around the edge. And just that part was so comforting. And it's just, you just it's to rub it over and over again. And, and it, those things, like a stuffed animal or a blankie or, or even a binky, that's usually, you, when children carry on, it's like, hey, you're six years old, time, time to give up the blankie, okay? Those things give us, and sometimes we treat sin the same way. It's so comfortable. We become comfortable with sin. And I'm going to tell you, there's, I mean, it's just go without saying, it's kind of like, I'm, I feel like even if I'm preaching on this, it's like, those are, well, duh. But why, uh, but there's a reason why a pastor, a teacher, a church, has, we have to turn to one another and say, oh man, don't become comfortable with your sin. We have to say it, right? Because we, we have this propensity, even as a Christ follower, we've been saved, sanctified, delivered, but the delivered part was like, yeah, but can I just bring this one along with me? And we find great comfort in that sin. Do not become, do not find comfort in your sin. And, and I'm, I'm, once again, I'm going to try to, to hold back from naming specific sins because I don't want us to start a list and I don't want you to not hear yours and so you're like, you're off the hook or you feel like I'm picking on yours, right? We're just going to trust the Holy Spirit right now speaking to each and every one of us because we all know where we're tripping up as Christ followers. If you're not a Christ follower here today, that's okay. You're not off the hook. It's just you're eavesdropping in the conversation and you see what it means to have a life surrendered to Jesus. The third thing that I want to point out with what it means to have a 180 would be 
Do not excuse or overlook your sin. Different than underestimating, different than finding comfort in it, it's just excusing it, overlooking it, or just dismissing. It's, it's, it's okay. It's, it's, I'm, or I can't help it. It's, it's just the way I am. It's just the way I am. It's just, you all just going to have to get used to it. I think God has come to grips with where the sin is in my life. I think he's okay with it. And uh, I'll be whole in heaven. I'll be whole in heaven, you know. It's, I'm, I've, you know so I'm, right now though, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm just going to keep practicing whatever I'm doing here. Or um, I'll just let it go. Do not underestimate your sin. Do not find comfort in your sin. Do not excuse or overlook your sin. Um, okay, these are my favorite 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2s. There are two places that have a chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 that would apply to what we're talking about today. And that is out of Romans and out of Hebrews. And if you want to turn there, it'd be great because these are wonderful passages. If you, and you may be familiar with these, you may not. These are, these are great ones to write down, put on a sticky note, put on your, your screensaver, throw up on your dresser, put on your dashboard of your car. Somehow get these verses in front of you or at least parts of them. So Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by the testing, by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. I love that. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, this passage, it's, it just went on about all these great people of God that went on before us, and now they're up in these stands rooting us on as we run a race. That's the image that we've been given. Since we're surrounded by a cloud of people in these stands of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, and I love it, it uses the other phrase, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before, uh, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Throw off that sin, a 180 from your sin. My friends, if you're struggling with a sin right now, if there is a sin or a couple things that you just been, and you found yourself going, getting in a rut, repent. That means turn. Confess it, repent from it, and keep praying for strength. Keep praying for strength. Keep praying and rely on his strength and rely on his strength and rely on his strength. He is able. Jesus had a consistent message. Uh, the apostles had a consistent message. Repent and follow him. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and follow him. So that is what's supposed to change. This is the part that should not change. What part should not change? That's the question we want to answer for the remaining of our time. Remain in the condition, quote unquote, that you were in. And there are three areas that I see, and we'll hit each one of those. And that is, uh, he, he deals with this passage, he's dealing with in verses uh, uh, 12, 12 through 24, we're going to kind of hit upon those on three areas that there's a condition. And you see, you see the notes in front of us, so it's not a, not a surprise, these areas, but marriage. Uh, he deals with marriage issues, religion, and work issues. And that, those are the ones we want to hit upon uh, really quickly um, or throughout the rest of our time. So in verse, um, verses 12 through 16, so he's already said, um, turn your back, do a 180, and then you get at the end of chapter 6, he's like, flee from sexual immoral, uh, immorta- immorality. Um, and then he, he goes into saying, okay, you're, you, that was a natural segue then, as I said before, into um, uh, just so there's no buyer's remorse, you're going to have to repent, just so you know what you're getting into. When you put your hundy out there, and that includes repenting, turning from your sin, 180. But it also does not include these things. He said, 
have discernment with these things. And he starts then with folks that were wrestling over, like, I've come to know Jesus, and now I'm married to someone who has not. What do I do? And he, he's saying this. So verse 12, to the rest of you, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife, and you can interchange genders there, uh, so a brother has a wife or a sister has a husband, um, so the message just isn't to men here, but also women who have a husband that's in this condition. Um, brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him. He should not divorce her. If any woman who has a husband or deals with the other gender who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For an unbelieving husband is made made holy because of the wife, and an unbelieving wife is made holy because of the husband, and otherwise your children would be unclean, but as I said, they are holy, and that is, that is all about right there, the fact that there's a believing parent that can pour into the children, not that when a parent, that's, I want to dispel any kind of bad theology, which is, well, if mama becomes a Christian, automatically the children are, are Christians, and some people believe that, and I just want to deal with that right off the bat. No, it just means that when mama becomes a Christian then they are being taught about faith in Christ um, much, much better. So otherwise, your children would be unclean, uh, but as it, as it is, they are holy. Verse 15, but if an unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. Um, in, in, if they want to have that, pursue that, in such case, the brother or sister is not enslaved or stuck in that relationship. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you would save your husband or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? And we just pay attention to that language. That once again, it's not the husband or wife literally being the one that saves, but because of your Christ-centered presence, um, that that unbelieving spouse um, comes to know Jesus, becomes saved because of your testimony. And I'll cover that a little bit here. I'm going to unpack that a little bit here. The, the message we have is, what condition should you remain in? Don't leave your relationships. I want to broaden this. It says about marriage here, but I think many people who surrender to Jesus, not only within a marriage to an unbelieving spouse, but also those that have friendships who, with uh, people who are not following Jesus, and they, they, they feel like, well, now that I'm a Christian, I have to leave everyone who's not a Christian and just be just around a holy huddle, and that's it. And the message here is that, no, what does not change is that you remain in relationships that you were there. Now, the, 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 the qualifier is this. Unless those friends are leading you astray. I had a, good, I had a great conversation with a very good friend uh, within the last couple of weeks who shared with me a little bit of his story. He was talking about um, those, some that he associated with uh, before he was a Christian. He, he drank heavily. And he, hang ar- he hung around people that, that drank heavily. And when he came to know Jesus, he was one that needed to totally give up alcohol altogether because he, he came to the conclusion he was an alcoholic and to even have a drink would send him back spiraling, spiraling into this lifestyle. And he discovered after he became a Christian that whenever he's around these friends, that really was the glue that held him together was there was a drink around all the time. And he, he said, you know what? I had to change who I was around. I love these people that I was around. I really do. I want to see them come to know Jesus, but I couldn't do it, and I knew that. And so, he, so that's the qualifier I put on this, is that sometimes with friendships, you need to separate yourself because y- you, you know that you need to stay strong. But as a general rule, don't leave relationships, and especially, as Paul mentions here, within a married relationship. This is the advice or the direction that I would give for those within this situation, whether it's a marriage uh, to someone who has not surrendered to Jesus yet or to friendships. And there are three things that I want to encourage you is to pray, live, and love. The first thing I want to encourage you to do in those relationships is pray diligently. Pray diligently for those who have not surrendered to Jesus yet that you love dearly. Pray diligently. I have, a, I have a, a friend um, uh, at a previous church that we were at, and her husband did not follow Christ for years. Years. She would come volunteer for everything. She was just a very faithful volunteer in everything. And she prayed 
and prayed and prayed. And uh, her husband had a heart attack. And um, she had shared with him, been clear, shared with him, but he had a heart attack and it, and it was a wake-up call for him. He survived and he surrendered to Jesus and he is, he is sometimes more fired up than her and she's pretty fired up. And he's diligent, he, comes, he, come, he goes to church all the time, he surrendered to Jesus, he's very faithful and his life was changed. And I just remember her sharing with me that um, she went so many years where she thought it was hopeless but she faithfully prayed, diligently. She diligently prayed. So I'm gonna encourage you, diligently pray for that person that you love dearly that has not yet surrendered to Jesus. There is hope. There is hope. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll make your path straight. And I know it's tough, but pray. He is greater. The second thing is live faithfully. Live faithfully. If you have um, someone very close to you that has not surrendered to Jesus, it will be difficult for them to surrender to your Jesus if you are struggling living faithfully. I encourage you more than ever to learn and, and grow, be a disciple, be discipled, and learn and grow. You're not going to be perfect. But even, so, did you know that you can be someone who's faithful but imperfect? Let's not be confused, my friends. You can be faithful and imperfect. I just, just me and even just reading um, yesterday at length about David, King David, uh, his predecessor, King Saul, had no heart for God. David had, was a man after God's own heart. Have you read about David? That dude's imperfect. That dude was imperfect. He's dead. He was imperfect. And as I'm, as I'm reading through the story again, it's just striking me that, wait, he's a man after God's own heart? The thing is, is that he kept coming back over and over again, and he was he was he wasn't uh, he wasn't messing around like Saul did. He just hired a witch to prophesy and some of his crazy stuff he got into. But David, he was faithful and imperfect. Um, for us, um, be faithful, live faithfully, and that sets a precedent. The third thing is that love extravagantly. Pray diligently, live faithfully, and love extravagantly. Love covers over a multitude of sins, amen? Love that person right where they are. Right where they are. Whether it's someone that is a spouse or a very good friend, a brother or sister, a parent, a child of yours, whoever they are, Pray for them diligently. Um, live faithfully and love them extravagantly exactly where they are. Now, if you go in with both guns blazing and start holding Christian moral standards to them, you know, you're doing this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. And the Bible says this and this and this. You're telling someone who does not walk by the same, uh, they're not playing the same sheet music you are. And we want to we get them the new sheet music, the new, the new life where they want to play that, pick up that new instrument and play it with the sheet music that you have. So you don't ha- start shoving sheet music in front of them that's different. So love them extravagantly exactly where they're at. Um, pray, live, and love. There's, there's another change. So stay where you are. Stay, stay in the condition that you are. As Paul said, just because you become a Christian doesn't mean you have a license then to, like, to leave and forsake all people that you love and care for that are not surrendered to Jesus. Stay in those relationships. And he had those qualifiers that, that we hit upon there. The second area has to do with religion. I'm going to hit upon this really quick because there's some, it could be a little confusing. He goes in and says, verse 17, 
Only let each person lead a life that the Lord has assigned to him or her and to which God has called him or her. This is the rule to all churches. Was anyone at the time when they were called already circumcised? That's religious behavior, religious, a Jewish religious uh, um, practice. Or let him seek not to remove the marks of circumcision or undo the circumcision. I'm not sure how that happens, but he has it in here. Uh, was anyone at the time of of his calls uncircumcised, let him not seek circumcision. For neither the circumcision counts for anything, nor the uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. So religiously, and how do we see this uh, religiously? I'm not saying, and I, I don't want to make it, when I say this, stay as you are. If you're already Muslim, stay Muslim in Jesus. No, um, which that wouldn't apply right here anyhow, but anyone listening, um, uh, to this later on, let me be very clear that what he's saying is that since Christianity um, came out of uh, Judaism, um, and at first there was the confusion on whether Christianity was just a Jewish sect, and but there was a clarification that said, no, God has made this 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 is Judaism fulfilled that is now for the whole world and not just for a class of people. But everyone now has this opportunity. And so before, under Judaism, to know God meant that you had to do certain religious practices to be accepted by God, including circumcision. And then you can make a whole list of things. Circumcision was like the biggie, right? And so these confused people are coming in and saying, well, I want to be a Christ follower, but then they're saying that I need to go have that religious thing done. And it's like, and I don't, no, I don't know about that. And Paul says, no, stay as you are, because that's not the real heart of the issue. Don't get caught up with the religious, but about the obedience to God. And here is the summary of that command. When you say, well, follow the commandments of God. And all of a sudden, some of us just start clicking in with, okay, I got my list of do's and don'ts that I want to give all new Christians. And if they don't do these things, we're going to start dragging them in front. Because he said, throw the immoral brother from you. Well, they don't do the things we do it, so we're going to make sure they know this is how you do it. And it's like, throw away your list. Throw away your list, folks. Because Jesus says, there's one thing on the list. He says in John chapter 13, verse 34, he says, a new command that I give you. What's that new command? Love one another. What do you say elsewhere? He says, the greatest command is this. Is, do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength? And the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said all the law and the prophets is summarized in these commands, this command right here. Love God, love others. So when I see, then therefore, whenever I see in New Testament it being written about following commands, I go back to say, what did Jesus say about the commands then? And he said, here's the deal. Love one another. So when I read this, I see it says it's not about a religious exercise, but it's about fulfilling, but keeping the commandments of God, which you start with that first one, and that fulfills everything else. Is this what I'm about to do, the most loving thing to God and to others? Is what I'm about to do the most loving thing? Is what I'm about to do required in order to do the most loving thing to God and to others? Communion, for instance. We do communion, but one can choose not to do communion, and it's okay. It's okay. One can choose to do it every day of their life, and that's okay. We do it as an act of worship. You can worship standing, sitting. You can worship using a song that's 300 years old. You can worship using a song that's three days old. It's not about a religious behavior. It's not about an outward religious behavior, but it's about the love that flows from our hearts, and so love one another. The last part that he hits upon here is, is really interesting, and this has been a... This has been a misappropriated passage in some cases. And you'll understand as we walk through this. But, and I'm just going to, we're going to categorize this as work. So there was marriage or relationships, religion or behavior, trying to be faithful to, to God, and then work. And so uh, verse 20, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when you called? And bondservant is a great word for there, but also slave works as well. But we conjure in our minds what all slavery means. And culturally, it, may, it means something a little different in this culture. More like an indentured servanthood. Uh, some, yes, in that culture, were slaved against their will. 
but this is mostly an indentured servanthood kind of kind of thing where one can earn or be freed uh, eventually after after working. There's a lot more to unpack there, but just understand the terminology. We really do want the terminology to work because of the way that Paul flips it upside down here in a minute. Do not be concerned about it if you were uh, you, when you when you came Jesus, you became surrendered to Jesus. You were enslaved. Well, all of a sudden you're like, I'm now in trouble. Uh, because I'm a Christian, should I stay being a slave um, or not? Um, For he was called, but if you can gain your opportunity for freedom, avail yourself of that opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant or slave is a freed man in the Lord. So even if you are bonded to somebody, um, uh, uh, forced to work or under uh, servitude, you are freed in the Lord, but keep serving. Likewise, he who is free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You are a slave to Jesus. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men then following that. So brothers, sisters, in whatever condition each was called there, let him remain and God, do not seek. So this is, we're going to throw this a wider net on this uh, as far as um, work. And I have, for almost 30 years, have done ministry, and a lot of that time has been with um, young people, 20-somethings, late teens, 20-somethings. And right at the, the point in their life where they're considering the call of God on their life and what God is leading them to long term. And I have counseled many of, of early 20-somethings, particularly into the mid-20s, who come to me and say, you know, I've come to Jesus, and usually the word dude is in there somewhere. Dude, like, like the bear bears. I like those. Dude, what are you doing? Give Hundy over. Um, dude, uh, I feel, feel like, like I'm just called to, to just, I, just be a, a Christian. I think I feel called to ministry. And I, okay, Really, dude, let's talk about it. And so we, we talk, and what I find after a course of conversation is that young person, because if they're really called to ministry, I get really excited if it's kind of, a, if you sense it's a genuine call. But a lot of times it was, they're called to be a full-time Christian, which in their interpretation, some of them is just sit around a coffee shop, because their impression of this is what it is, sit around a coffee shop and just read the Bible and t- then talk to people about Jesus come by. And that's really, it's just a laid back, I just want to be a, a Christian full time, and then if someone if someone could pay me for it, kind of thing. And I'm like, that's not how it works. Um, so you 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 go get a job, okay? Go J O B. Get get someone to pay you for something, but just go out and do something. And then, so what we're called to is not to to just be. You're a Christian, so I'm just going to give you money to be a Christian. You, it's, no, you're not full time Christian. You get paid for it. But what the encouragement is is that. In our work, we are to be a full-time as a Christ follower in whatever that we do. Uh, whether you are called to the mission field or pastoral ministry or a mission, ministry of some kind, but more than likely, the vast majority of people that I've counseled, their real call was this. Go do what God has called you to vocationally, but you're a full-time Christian in that vocation. And believe me, that's needed sometimes much more than just more pastors, more missionaries, more... and although. If you're called, you need to do it. But we really need Christian electricians, Christian engineers, Christian teachers, Christian administrators, Christian businessmen. We need Christians in the arts. We need Christians Christians in every part of our... We really need need missionaries that are doing work, full-time doing something, but they are surrendered to Jesus in that work. And that's what Paul is emphasizing here is that just because you've surrendered to Jesus, stay in the condition that you're in, which is glorify God exactly where he has placed you until he makes it abundantly clear to do otherwise. Because you are needed to, sh- to be salt and light exactly where you are in your vocation. We need that. Be a full-time Christian right where you are. I love Colossians chapter 3, verse 17 through 24, out of the message. They do a really good job, because I've quoted this verse so many times out of ESV. We're going to look at the whole passage in the message. 17 to 24 says this. I think this gives us some good guidance in regards to this. Let the word of Christ, the message, have run of the house. 
Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing. Sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master, Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. Then he gets a little more specific. He says, wives, understand and support your husbands by submitting to them in ways that honor the master. Husbands, go all in, uh, go, go all out in love with, for your wives. Don't take advantage of them. Children, do what your parents tell them. Children, do what your parents tell them. Did that get through yet? This is where the parents nudge. Okay, we'll keep moving. This delights the master to no end. Parents, don't come down too hard on your children or you'll crush their spirits. So he's unpacking what it means to, in word, action, whatever, do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Servants, do what, or workers in whatever field, do what you're told by your earthly masters and don't just do the minimum that will get you by. Do your best. Work from the heart for your real master, for God, confident that you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you are serving is Christ. Amen? Stay as you are. If you have surrendered to Jesus, bloom where you're planted. Stay, stay right where God has called you work-wise and seek to be salt and light exactly where you're at. Unless in time, through discernment, through the word, through others, you sense a specific call in another direction, in another place. Because some of you, I do never want to underestimate if God has called you to the mission field or the pastor, ne- never let your pastor cut it. I heard a message, he said, I'm not supposed to go. No, I didn't. I just said, y'all just need to focus right where you're at and be salt and light. And when God makes a specific call, listen. Okay, but we're not off the hook. Come as you are, just don't stay that way. Will you pray with me? God, give us guidance, give us wisdom. Help us to discern what to change and what to remain, allow to remain the same within our lives. Even now, speak to us. I pray especially for that discernment of sin and a 180. And I pray for a discernment of and a peace with that which needs to remain the same. I pray specifically and, and particularly for those that are in a marriage that they have a spouse that's not yet surrendered. And boy, the, the, the struggle that is. Um, they love their spouse and they love Jesus and there's a tearing. God, I pray that you will, you will be faithful, that you will give peace, that you will give direction. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Dr. David Mabry, lead pastor at Orange Friends Church in Lewis Center, Ohio. Do you have a question or a comment for Pastor David? Would you like to share your story or how Pastor David's messages have helped you in your journey with the Lord? We would love to hear from you. Please email us at transformed at orangefriendschurch.org. Join us next week for another relevant, Christ-centered message. This podcast is a production of Orange Friends Church in Lewis Center, Ohio. For more information, please visit our website at orangefriendschurch.org. Thank you, and have a wonderful week.